do you ever wonder what happened to the golden age of flying? In popular culture, the allure of luxurious air travel was a recurring motif. Period pieces often depict protagonists stepping onto planes dressed in their Sunday best, ready to embark on a grand tour of jet setting. Advertisements for airlines showcased elegant travelers enjoying gourmet meals and personalized service in plush cabins. This cultural fascination with flying as a glamorous experience further perpetuated the image of air travel as a luxury that only a fortunate few could afford. The first real government involvement in civil aviation was the establishment of air mail in mid-1918, growing to a continental route in 1924 using old military surplus aircraft. By 1925, the post office began to contract private airlines to carry mail on intercity routes. It granted 12 contracts for spoke routes off the backbone. These would eventually become Pan Am, Delta, Braniff, American, United, TWA, Northwest, and Eastern Air. After a string of accidents, President Coolidge signed a law which tasked the Department of Commerce with investigating civil aviation. The department's first initiative was to make sure pilots were properly certified to fly their aircraft and that the aircraft were properly maintained. Later, it included implementing a standardized set of navigation markers for major airstrips and radio navigation beacons. In 1938, Congress saw it fit to move air regulation into its own organization under the Department of Commerce, calling it the Civil Aeronautics Authority and the Civil Aeronautics Board. Initially, the organizations worked in tandem to regulate fares, determine routes, and investigate crashes. This also established 16 trunk airlines, which were the initial 16 that were deemed common carriers providing scheduled air services domestically. This granted them the status of important enough for economic protection. These trunk carriers gained government assistance through subsidy, promotion, and protectionism in exchange for some regulation. After the war, aircraft manufacturers were flush with cash and airlines had an influx of experienced pilots and spare aircraft. Passengers found themselves wanting to get places faster, now flush with cash during the post-war economic boom. But this giant surge in volume, coupled with much larger planes, and even jet aircraft, made planes start fucking crashing into one another. Congress renamed the CAA the FAA and made air traffic control a requirement. In addition, it also gave FAA sweeping powers over pilots, airframes, air crews, runways, airports, you name it, they regulate it. Airline ticket prices began to rise sharply in the 60s and 70s, even though flight times were decreasing and passenger loads were increasing. The reason being, airlines were regulated like they were public utilities. Every single fare and every single route had to be approved by the CAB, which only granted the airline a flat 12% return on investment. Now the CAB assumed 55% capacity at full price to calculate this number, which seems generous but fuel costs were increasing by the day, and inflation was killing consumers' ability to discretionarily spend on an airline ticket. It was also impossible to add a new route, sometimes taking eight or more years to get a route approved. The application process was theoretically simple, but painfully Byzantine in reality. By 1969, almost every city was at least somewhat connected, so the CAB had no reason to approve new routes, and airlines began to stagnate. Not wanting to stagnate, the trunk airlines got together and allowed the CAB to mediate agreements. These agreements would limit the number of seats trunks would offer on a route to ensure each one got a slice of the pie and to give consumers the illusion of choice. This way, no airline would come under too much pressure and have to lower the prices on routes to compete, and the airlines could continue to expand. Thus, the addition of gratuitous features like in-flight bars or lounges. If your plane can carry 350 people, but by your agreement you're only allowed to carry 300, fuck it, add a sky bar. This has the added benefit of having passengers think you're offering luxury at a great price, when in actuality you're just engaging in a government-facilitated price-fixing cartel. Remember those 16 trunk airlines I talked about earlier? By 1978, only six of them were still around, and nobody else was allowed in the Permanent Certificate of Necessity Club. Sure, you had lots of small service carriers connecting small cities with large ones and a few interstate carriers in Florida and California where the states were large enough to accommodate them. However, 90% of air carrier traffic was dominated by the Big Six as they were the only ones allowed to fly interstate routes. 
the minimum domestic airfare cost was close to $500 in today's money, with international flights retailing for well over $3,000 for coach. After decades of operating under strict regulations, the airline industry saw a seismic shift in the 1980s with the advent of deregulation. We've already begun a series of reorganization plans which will be completed over a period of three years. We've also proposed abolishing almost 500 federal advisory and other commissions and boards. But I know that the American people are still sick and tired of federal paperwork and red tape. This change marked a turning point as airlines were suddenly freed from the many government-imposed constraints that had stifled innovation and competition. The regulations that once limited route expansion, fare pricing, and service offerings were now completely gone. As passengers were now able to choose from a wider range of airlines, routes, and pricing options, their choices began to reveal their true priorities. The focus shifted from providing gratuitous luxuries to offering a blend of quality service at a competitive price. Passengers revealed their preferences for lower fares, convenient schedules, and reliable service over elaborate in-flight luxuries. Airlines had to tailor their offerings to meet these preferences in order to survive. Airline luxury is not a case of corporate greed, but rather revealed preference. 